So welcome everyone. My name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix. You are here for a special Midnight's for Maniacs double feature of cheerleading movies. And uh, I would love for all of us who um, have never been to the Roxy Theater. Can you raise your hand right now? This is your first time. Beautiful. Let's give them a hand for a second. Now this is the oldest movie theater in San Francisco. And uh, it's been through a lot. It's been through a lot of different decades. And I, I am always very proud that this is the theater that helped make David Lynch's Eraserhead a cult classic. Uh, Eraserhead is coming up again, playing here at the Roxy to celebrate that. It's uh, 40 years of this um, underground type of cinema that the Roxy has been playing. This movie theater used to be a porn theater. Um, and uh, what it is now is a non-profit theater, so by you being here and just purchasing a ticket, you're helping San Francisco stay uh, old school. Um, tonight, in fact, both of the movies we're playing are in 35 millimeter. So can we give it up for our projectionist tonight? Often when you have 35 millimeter film, uh, some very interesting things happen. Uh, you'll see maybe scratches. Uh, sometimes uh, when the reel changes from one to the other, it, it, you'll see uh, some sort of transition or you might miss part of a line. Or This is like being in a museum because there are only one or two other theaters in all of San Francisco that screen 35 millimeter prints. And uh, it's really special that you would come out here to the mission to watch perhaps your favorite movie, Bring It On. <laughs> Who has never seen Bring It On? Raise your hand. Beautiful. Now those people yelling at you, they're really old <laughs> because they saw this movie when it came out 17 years ago they feel old right now and what's exciting about bring it on I teach film history at the Academy of Arts so there's some people getting extra credit right now to come and see bring it on and I'd like to ask which bring it on do you like best out of all five of them. There's some film history for you. Who has seen all five of them raise their hand? Right here. We got two people who have seen all five. Bring it on. Now I like to compare this to those of you who have seen all three Godfathers. Who's seen all three Godfather films? Okay, a little bit more. But I take Bring It On very seriously. Now, Midnight's for Maniacs is a film series that celebrates underrated and overlooked films. I've been doing this now for 16 years. Started right around the time of Bring It On coming out in theaters. And I can tell you that nobody took this film seriously when it came out. It was just made for 13-year-olds. And over the years, it has built a very strong cult following. Some of you, you know every single line of this movie. Some of you, you know the cheers in this film. And this is what a cult classic is. But what I'm really excited about for you to be perhaps re-experiencing here is that this movie is really smart. And this movie is actually progressive. And being in high school, those are some of the darkest days for some of us who didn't fit in. And Peyton Reed, the director of this movie, as well as the screenwriter who I would like you to pay attention to when we watch the credits, they really did a service for a lot of young folks. Nowadays, we've got this thing called It Gets Better because there are so many suicides, so many suicides of young people who don't know how to handle high school. And I can sincerely say that a movie like Bring It On, it changes lives. So this, this is where you're coming out here to have a good time. Some of you, it's going to be quite nostalgic because your favorite actress stars in this movie 
Gabrielle Union. Let's give it up. Then there's also Kirsten Dunst. Then there's also this uh, other guy named Jesse. What's that guy's name? Jesse Bradford. You know the character name? There we go. These actors here in this movie, this is how every young person starts. Is that you watch them in perhaps genre films, TV shows. And then Kirsten Dunst, she stars in Lars von Trier movies. And wins the Cannes Film Festival. But it all starts right here with a movie like Bring It On. Now I put together a couple of trailers before this film. To try and get you in the mood. Uh, one is that... There is a couple of double features coming up celebrating this idea of underrated and overlooked films. Those of you that like the TV show Twin Peaks, you might want to watch some of the movies that Twin Peaks was inspired by. And there'll be two films, Blue Velvet and an old 1950s film called Peyton Place. But how about a double feature of The Fifth Element and Run Lola Run? Because Luke Besson, he's got a new science fiction film coming up. I'm excited. The Fifth Element, it, it didn't do too well when it came out. But some people, they really like that film. And we'll be celebrating its 20th anniversary here. But, I also am excited to tell you that the trailers you see before this movie are the upcoming show in July. And uh, these movies, they, they might mean a whole lot to you, and they have not played in San Francisco, I can tell you, for 20 years. Just like Bring It On has not played here in this city for 17 years. You guys, it means so much to me that you came out tonight. But I'd like you to pull out your ticket stuff. We've got a raffle. Now, if you win this raffle, I've got this, this really weird thing called a CD. I don't know if any of you still have it, but it's an original soundtrack to Bring It On. It's got a couple of songs by Black. You know Black? How about Daphne and Celeste? Uh-huh. How about 50 Cent? <laughs> this is a very rare CD now. And how about number, uh, number 14? Where's number 14? Come on up. Hey, give her a hand. Stop being jealous. There you go. You can beat that. Now, as I said, it means a lot that you came out to see this movie. You probably own it on VHS. But when you come into a movie theater, I really do, no matter how much fun you're having, I want you to be able to respect the theater, the projectionist, and all these people who've never seen Bring It On. It still works. So please, do not yell out funny one-liners. Do not try and take over the theater as if we're coming here to see you. We're truly trying to celebrate what I feel is a real underrated masterpiece from the year 2000. You guys, thank you so much. My name is Jesse Hawthorne. Thanks. This has been nice to meet you. Can we give it up for Bring It On? Thank you so much for sticking through uh, our projector problems, as I was saying. That's what uh, 35 millimeter is all about. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have about a 10 minute break. And I'm hoping most of you are going to stick around. This is a double feature, so it's free. You're already in here. You're not yet anything else to do on a Monday night anyways. And uh, I really want to stress that this next film, Revenge of the Cheerleaders, um, 
not only is celebrating a 40th anniversary, but uh, is truly one of the most surreal and creative TNA films from the 1970s. Uh, specifically because we've got uh, a very exciting uh, experimental filmmaker who uh, was just starting to dabble into cinema. And um, we have an uncut 35 millimeter print here of Revenge of the Cheerleaders. So do whatever you need to do for the next 10 minutes. Uh, you really don't want to miss this. I'll see you in a bit. Could you clarify that we have him here in person? Not clarifying anything. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Author and Fix, and I've been doing a Midnight's for Maniacs film series for 16 years now. Started at the Four Star Theater. And I've even seen a couple of people tonight who used to come out all the way 16 years ago. Give them a hand for a second here. And a lot of you, um, the reason why you're here tonight is uh, because that's the type of moviegoer you are, is that you will seek out the films that no one has ever heard of. Uh, in this case tonight, we saw that I had quite a few students, in fact, who came out for extra credit to watch Bring It On. And um, I tried to warn them that if they came out, then they would actually get a second film for free. And this is something that they've never heard of. Uh, and it's a really important thing to remember, uh, that a lot of the students that I have at the Academy of Art University, if they're 18 years old, they were born the year before Bring It On came out. And so their context, let's say they started watching movies at a very young age, like many of us in this room, let's say they started at 12, then that means, you know, 2011, that they start watching movies. And so this uh, idea I've been teaching for 11 years, this idea that you can't assume that a younger generation has context for things that you took for granted. Uh, is very important. Some of the other film teachers that I have worked with will get quite frustrated and depressed that the younger people, one teacher said, they don't even know who Jimmy Stewart is. They don't know who George Clooney is. <laughs> because why would they be watching George Clooney films at the age of 11? This, this is something that I find fascinating. Uh, the longer I watch movies, and the more decades that I luckily get to survive through, um, I see this cycle happen. And so perhaps a movie like Revenge of the Cheerleaders, uh, it, it might have been the type of film that you sought out at whatever age or time period that you were looking for uh, offbeat, underground, uh, sexploitation, exploitation, um, we go through these cycles. And I know that uh, when I was growing up in the 1980s and into the early 90s, uh, the VHS revolution was very important. And I feel like I was part of that first wave, uh, being 10 years old and in 1986, and uh, renting as many films as possible, staring at the video covers, uh, trying to decide what to rent based on the art on these video covers. And um, each, site, each generation, though, has to find these films in a different way. And if that, that was through DVDs, uh, now it is through streaming. Um, no one way is better than the other. In fact, uh, there is going to be nostalgia towards this era right now where you can go on to Netflix and watch any film you want at any time that you want. That was a science fiction concept for me as a kid. I dreamed of something like that, that you didn't have to turn on the TV at 7 p.m. to watch the film. You could decide to start watching, perhaps, Revenge of the Cheerleaders at 2.30 in the morning because you're up. Now, um, also over this past 11 years of teaching, uh, I started to find connections. You know, and I know it's the sort of the Kevin Bacon game. Um, but just like, just like jazz music, where you're not just paying attention to a lead singer, you start to pay attention to who's playing the drums and who's actually playing the saxophone, and uh, you start to find crisscrossing. 
And uh, Revenge of the Cheerleaders was one of the most exciting crisscrosses that I had uh, ever come into contact with. Uh, I grew up watching competition films and exploitation movies, uh, the genre of a TNA film. There are rules. There are, um, uh, l there's a language that you are riffing off of an older one and trying to outdo them. Uh, genre movies often, you take those ingredients and you put a new spin onto it. You have to deliver what people are expecting and then every once in a while a filmmaker will subvert those expectations. And Revenge of the Cheerleaders um, happened when uh, I screened it over at the Castro Theater 10 years ago. I tracked down a print that turned out to be um, censored. Um, and tonight, supposedly, this is not censored. Yes. And uh, that's a big thing when it comes to exploitation movies. You are always waiting or hoping to find the extra 48 seconds that somehow has been trimmed out of all of the movies. Now, in my underrated and overlooked cinema class, I teach a book called Devotional Cinema. And in this class, we study what this truly revolutionary writer, filmmaker, and in my opinion, historian of film, Nathaniel Dorsky, is trying to talk about how we watch cinema. Not just what we watch, but how we watch it. How it actually goes through our eyes, how being in a movie theater like this, that our eyes are almost like we've got a projector, and we have to somehow take this in, that when we finish the film, we're gonna be in this experience, a post-film experience, or perhaps you, you have like a Stendhal syndrome where you get sucked into the film so much that then when you leave the theater, everything has shifted for you. Now in this, this text, Devotional Cinema, which is truly a Bible for I'm sure many of you in this room, a, a genuine Bible, like you will turn to this when you are not relating to anyone else in a movie theater. No one, even a movie that you've seen and somebody else you connect with and you find out that they did not watch the movie in the same way that you did, you turn to devotional cinema. And films that Nathaniel Dorsky was inspired by or had that shift with, uh, perhaps Ro Roberto Rossellini's Journey in Italy, uh, a handful of Ozu films, his personal experience with that I have then bastardized and turned into movies like Revenge of the Cheerleaders. I see the devotion and the experience as truly profound to get to watch a movie like this here in the oldest movie theater in San Francisco with a bunch of uh, true weirdos, right? It's okay if you don't like being a weirdo, uh, you are and you sought this experience out. Um, and I, I don't need to necessarily tell you that a filmmaker like Quentin Tarantino or even Peyton Reed, who made Bring It On, that they grew up watching these movies. Uh, Quentin is much more overt about referencing uh, the movies that he loved in his films. But this type of cinema that was considered uh, trash or cheap entertainment for just cheaper than cheap people uh, dirty old men, perhaps. Uh, it actually has changed a generation of filmmakers. And uh, filmmakers like Sam Raimi and Peter Jackson, who start off making low-budget exploitation films, you see them take over Hollywood 15 or 20 years later. And that is truly what I'm hoping that some of you in this room are going to be able to do, is to see that this film, while it follows genre conventions, and it is truly part of a cheerleading exploitation experience, uh, it's also surreal cinema. There is also Salvador Dali and Louis Bunuel's uh, Un Chien Andalou in this. Now, I don't know if it's direct, but it's trying to perhaps subvert what you expect. And it is a, a really, it's 10 years of hoping that I could track down this uh, unedited print so that you can get full frontal bush. <laughs> Just like you were perhaps seeing in Un Chien Andalou. What looks grotesque could actually be highbrow art. And that's my true goal here with Revenge of the Cheerleaders uh, and perhaps even some of the filmmakers incognito coming out to see how 
uh, people actually experience the film, not just talk about it. Uh, there's a couple of trailers here that I feel are just as surreal uh, to get you maybe into the mood. It's not just older films from the 70s or from the 40s or from the 20s. Every generation has this type of film, and I hope you are looking for it in 2017. It's not always independent. Sometimes it's mainstream. Um, and that's what Midnight's for Maniacs is truly all about. You guys, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, on a Monday night, my name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix, and this is Midnight's for Maniacs. Now we got, we got good news and we got bad news. Bad news is that print turned out to be the censored version. You notice the zoom ins, they're grainy. They're often when you have the girls and they're dancing and it suddenly... That means that the only two, the two or three prints, I've tracked down two of them, that means the original version is just truly lost. The good news is that there is a Blu-ray that was just released that actually pieced together all of that footage. So now you have a reason to go buy that fucking thing. More importantly, I'm really excited um, for perhaps some of you to write about this film. Um, this is truly surreal. I don't know how many times you've seen a film where you have 5 to 10 to 15 minutes of no dialogue, of just food fights, of just people freaking out and dancing. This is truly surreal cinema, and I, it scares me that some people will just say, that movie's weird. Because it takes critics like you, who perhaps stayed up really late on a Monday night, to take this seriously. I've rewatched this movie a lot. I see Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times in here. I see uh, The Third Man, Carol Reed. I see Vertigo. I see all of these things. I don't fucking know if Nathaniel Dorsky actually meant for that to be in there. But it's in there for me. And it truly does achieve something that I rarely have seen in movies before or now. And it's up to uh, you to actually convince people of it. All through time, Peter Bogdanovich, the only reason why people started to rewatch screwball comedies, which were considered completely ridiculous, was because of his writings. And every one of you, it's up to you, hopefully you dragged out some people, um, and hopefully you will force them to watch this film, because it's, it's, uh, it's not mean-spirited. This is a sex comedy that everyone is having fun with, and I hope that you saw a lot of similarities with Peyton Reed's Bring It On. Because that, that somehow makes it into the mainstream so we take it more seriously. This, in the underground, this is Jean Genet. This is truly surreal sex, and I think, hopefully, something very profound. So you guys, um, I know that you watched this movie with the creator of it. And to me, that's very, very special because I'm hoping you will track down the creator uh, who now makes some of the most important experimental films of this era. And the only way that you can watch them is in a movie theater. So I can't think of anything more great that you came out to watch Revenge of the Cheerleaders. My name is Jesse Althorn Fix. This is the Nights for Maniacs.